Uh, we are, uh, the whole part of our worship service this morning is based on what Lorraine read for us from the Gospel of Mark. Uh, and it's, uh, the ser- that's the foundation for our worship service this morning. So perhaps you'd like to know, learn a little bit more about this chap named Mark. Uh, well, uh, or the Gospel of Mark. As uh, many of you know, the Gospel of Mark is one of the four Gospels in the New Testament, our Christian scriptures. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Did you have to memorize all the names of the books of the Bible when you were a kid? I did. I'll start now. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. No, maybe you don't want to hear all that. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four canonical uh, Gospels that are in the text for us. Others were written... There were many other uh, Gospels that were written that didn't make it into the text. It took about 400 years uh, for the early Christian church to decide which was um, those writings that they would let in the text and those that they declared as heretical or weren't up to snuff, as it were, up to the standard. So um, Mark... Uh, We don't know much about Mark, actually. We don't know who the author of Mark is. It was written between 66 and 70 AD. That would place it just right around the time when there's lots of conflict in Palestine and in Jerusalem, because in 70 AD the temple was razed to the ground by the Romans. And so it was written during a time of great upheaval. And you can get that sense when you read the gospel. It's an action gospel. I've said that to you before, that it is a gospel that there's always something going on. Jesus is here, and Jesus is there, and the disciples are rushing after him uh, wherever he's going. Uh, And it's about lots of miracles. And um, one of the things that the gospel seeks to do is to dispel the rumor that Jesus was a magician rather than a healer. That was a rumor that was quite active at that time, and that he was, and that, of course, was seen to be evil and wicked. Uh, And so Mark is determined to dispel the sense that Jesus was a magician, but that Jesus was a healer. Uh, And also, there's this messianic secret. Uh, uh, You know, Jesus is always telling them, uh, don't, don't tell anybody who I am. There's kind of this sense of secrecy around this uh, in, in terms of what Jesus is seeking to do. It's very much a teaching gospel. And of course, we, uh, in terms of the gospel itself, there are a couple of endings. Uh, someone didn't like the ending that was uh, in the original gospel. Uh, it ends at 16, chapter 16, verse 8. Uh, And so they wrote another one. They said, that's too depressing an ending. The women get to the uh, tomb and uh, they think there's a resurrection and they're supposed to go out and tell the good news, but no one does. And so that ending didn't seem like, mm, it didn't fit very well. So someone a couple of hundred years later added the last uh, few verses from chapter 16, verse 8 onward. Uh, Entirely different style, but it's a much more hopeful Uh, ending to the gospel. So we see that uh, people took this gospel seriously uh, and that it it spoke to them and they wanted it to tell, to teach people about uh, the ministry of Jesus. If you, uh, in the the four gospels that we have, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, actually, uh, Matthew and Luke, uh, Mark is the earliest gospel and Matthew and Luke steal from him quite quite a bit. Uh, we would call it plagiarism today, but uh, they were comfortable picking most, well, all of the Gospel of Mark, plunking it in their Gospel, and then adding some stuff to it. So you can see all of the, the things that were going on with the text as people were wrestling with it. And Matthew and Luke thought that Mark had so many important things to say that they thought, hmm, we got to make sure that we don't lose that, so we'll put it in our gospel as well. That's part of the process of how we got the text. Uh, It didn't just drop out of the sky and find its way into our libraries and into our hearts. There was a very real process in how it was developed and comes to us. I tell you that to set the context. 
Because you see, uh, in that era, when the gospel was being written by whoever was writing it, we're not sure who the author was, there was lots of conflict, a great deal of conflict. And to be uh, someone who would stand against the Roman Empire and who would stand up as Jesus did was to be at risk. And yet it is a powerful teaching gospel. And that brings me to the passage that we have today. Jesus, the, the disciples, I can just imagine this. I can just imagine this. Because I've been at lots of meetings, and so have you. And you've been in lots of situations where the disciples are having a little bit of a heated discussion. They're saying to each other, you know what? I'm Peter. I'm the rock on which the church is going to be built, and I'm better than the rest of you. And I know more. So listen to me. I can just imagine they're in this room in Capernaum somewhere having this heated conversation about who is the greatest among them. Jesus kind of seems to come in in the middle of the conversation, but he suspects and he knows what's going on. And he says, if you want to be great, be like this child. If you want to be great, listen to the wisdom that a child can give you and bring to you. If you want to be great, you need to be the servant of all. You need to be prepared to be the last in line, but the one who stands forth and is the servant to all. And that brings me to the clip I watched that and I thought, wow, that kid really kind of stood up. Well, he sat down. He was at the chessboard. But he was brave enough, even quietly and timidly saying, I don't feel that way. I don't want to hate my opponent. I don't want to win at all costs. And the adult in that clip, who should be offering wisdom perhaps to the child, because that's how we normally think of it, right? The child is offering wisdom to him. I don't feel like that. I don't want to hate my opponents. And that's wisdom for us in community. That we, who name ourselves as a community of faith, need to be servant to all. Not just to the ones that we think, you know what, they've got lots of money. Maybe I'll be a little bit nicer to them and they'll, they'll get me the grant that I want or they'll get me what I want. Jesus tells us clearly in this reading from Mark that if we are to be true followers of Christ, if we are to be people who follow in Christ's way, follow his ministry, we are to be servant of all. That doesn't mean to, that when we have need that we set that aside and nobly and, uh, you know, sacrifice for others, except some of that will be part of who we are as Christians, won't it? We all have needs. At some point in time, I will need for you to come to me and to heal me and to help me heal or help me find a path when I'm lost. And then, in community and loving you, I would offer the same. Jesus predicated his whole ministry on the basis that we are to serve one another. Sister, let me be your servant. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may be your servant too. The sense that each one of us are called. I don't know where you are on your journey of faith in your walk with Jesus. I don't know where you are in that. But I do know this. That we need each other. That we need to walk together in community for our strengthening. And that we need to hold the Christ light, for, Christ light for each other. That little fella in that clip was saying that. 
I don't hate my uh, my opponent. I don't want to be like that. And we don't want to be like that either. So often, we marginalize groups in our world. And we have this superior attitude, or I'm better than, greater than, more than. This passage from Mark, this wisdom nugget that Jesus offers to us, two things, I guess. Look to our children for wisdom, because they're very often uncluttered. Their vision is not obscured. They see things that we've managed to put so much stuff in front of ourselves as adults that we don't follow through with the wisdom. And children have that uncluttered look at the world. Sometimes too much so, aren't they? Sometimes we say, shh, don't. <clears throat> when they are forthright and offer wisdom. And number two, So let us look to our children for the wisdom they have to offer. Let's get down to their level and listen to what they have to say to us. And number two, let us seek as a people of faith, as followers of the way, as lovers of Christ's ministry, to be servant of all. That is our goal, our mission, our vision, our dream for our work here at Central. So I invite you along on a journey. Don't worry, you won't be getting a pink Cadillac or any of those fabulous trappings that come with selling Mary Kay or uh, being the most successful in the room. But I can promise you this. You will have companions on the journey and we'll hold the Christ light for each other. Amen.